Happy what? Saturday. Welcome back to another episode, I guess, of All the Things. All the things. It's our show where we talk about all things related to God, life, and the Bible. Well, you know, I, I kind of messed that up. I don't know why. You know, I'm going to just have to do it again. All right. Do it again. It's live, it's live television. I don't know what to tell you. This is the show where we talk about all things Related, related to, to God, God the, like the Bible, God. and real life. That's yes. why I have it written yes. right here. You know, there, why? There we take a week we off. We take a week and off, and I can't even. I just cannot even. I'm Krista Bontrager, also known as Theology Mom. And I'm Monique Dusan. The world famous. Or, you know, just me. <laughs> From the just Center me. for Biblical Unity. Yes. And helping us on the show tonight, but with no camera, is the world famous Bob Bontrager. Hello. Official button pusher. We'll get that camera back. Uh, has anyone noticed like webcams are really hard to find right now? They're in scarcity. Like you, it's, it's it's everyone's zooming and you can't buy webcams. So uh, I accidentally uh, had to borrow his for work. So we want to en- encourage you to go share the show. Click on the share button because tonight's show is going to be amazing. Like, follow, share, comment, mm-hmm. all the things. All the things. Related to the show, and also join us on the live chat. Yes, come now. I I am. I'm joining <laughs> them on the live chat. Okay, now, that's cool. what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm trying to participate. See, oh, hi, wow. Allison, Look Justin, and Amy are here. Susanna's here. Annette, Kimba, Carmen. Hello, hello, hello. So join us on the live chat there on YouTube. Uh, we will try to fold you in if you are on Facebook. Yes, it we is, will get over to Facebook. It is a little more clunky over there. So if you really want to interact with us and interact with our guest tonight, go to the Theology Mom YouTube stream. And we got a new feature on the show. If you look at the screen, three, two, one. Whoa. Oh, we got I, motion, guys. There, wow. We're, We're doing big fancy. things now. See? <laughs> see? See? What ha- what can happen in a week? Bob's yes. working on uh getting some new things for the show. We're trying out a new mixer tonight. We're uh trying to improve our audio always. So hopefully give us some feedback about how we're sounding. So a lot of people here. Um yes. excited to be here. Um we're still in quarantine, technically. Yes. Here in the People's Republic of California. Today, I accidentally went into a store without a mask. And I oh, guess no. in our county, we are not technic. I mean, I guess it's like it's you do, optional. do you it's boo. Recommended. Do you boo. That is the new law in our county, the do you boo law. And so I went up to the store and I completely felt like a rebel. I felt like people were watching me, but I needed cilantro and lime. Don't ask why. But I did. I needed cilantro and limes and I had to go in without a mask and I felt good. Nobody called the police on you? No. That's good. It is. It is. Um, so Some we also had rebel. a little little picnic. Let's see if we got, yeah. see if we got the picnic picture. Quarantine picnic. Us in and out. Me with my mouth full, just trying to get through the picture. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, wow. that that That's a picture for you. Well, the thing that. is, is that they got all these. This is one of the drive through in and outs so you don't actually go inside. They're all drive through in and outs yeah, now. But, I know, but you, 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 you don't actually go inside this one, even when it's open. Mm-hmm. There's just an outdoor seating area. And they have all the tables with little signs on them that says, like, you can't sit here. So we all sat on the grass. Yes. Five feet away. <laughs> and talked to strangers and became one. Yeah. Yes. So there was some other people there. They had lawn chairs. I said, now that's the way to go. We need to throw yeah. some lawn chairs in our car. So yeah. that Because we, I'm sick of eating in the car. Yeah. So it was really nice sitting outside. We were there in the sunshine. The wind was blowing. It was very pleasant. It was good. So we had a little in and out picnic there in the parking lot. <laughs> At in and out And that is the face I make when I'm taking a picture with a full, full mouth. <laughs> I am sorry, friends. Yeah. This is a little thing. Somebody asked us last week. We were talking to a, a viewer. I said, do you guys like, whoops, do you guys. Uh, sorry, I covered my own face. It's getting fancy over there. That Somebody asked me, uh, do you guys, does Monique live with you? They're trying to figure out why we're together all the time. Yeah. Who asked that? Somebody did ask yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> One of our viewers. Yeah. I'm here. I'm here just every day. Yes. I'll be here all week, people. Her room's right up. I will be here right all week. There. Yes, In-N-Out has the best burgers. Yes, I do agree. Yeah. I so. wore my Plague Doctor mask to one. 
Oh, I, I should have sent that picture over to be seen on the show. Today we were in Walmart because <laughs> that's where we go. And oh my gosh, these people had on like epic masks. Oh my god. It was like three in one. It had They look like they were in a science fiction movie. It was horrible. It, you know when you see something that kind of make your skin crawl? It was kind of like that. It was kind of spooky. Mm-hmm. They're spooky masks. Yes. Uh, right. Side question. Susanna wants to know how you became friends. Oh, Susanna. Yeah. Oh, that's a story. That is. <laughs> we did that's, talk about that on it's the not for sh- primetime viewing. No, if you if, <laughs> no. You, if you talk if you go in the archive back uh, in one of the early shows, we did a show on um the supernatural and dreams, and we told the story of how we became friends. So if you want to know the connection between us becoming friends and dreams, you'll have to go watch the show. Maybe maybe Bob can find it for you at some point. Or maybe All right. Uh, or maybe uh, Laura Hartley, our official TA, can find it. <laughs> so it's back in the ar- archives there. All right. Yeah. But oh, it's a story. To, yeah. It is a doozy of a story for it you. It is a story. Okay. I'm excited about this show. I know. I'm excited. This is my favorite apologist. We've got Elisa Childers here on the show, and uh, her expertise is in progressive Christianity. And I've met her a couple of times, and she's I'm not going to lie. She's the best i'm just like such a fan girl i'm Yay. so excited that is awesome i have never met her but i talked to her for five minutes just now and it yeah. was really cool <laughs> so all right are we uh ready to go i am okay i, I am ready i right. am you know people okay so american let's, gospel yes yeah so mm-hmm. let's bring on elisa childers fire up the zoom machine and get her on there She's got a fancy new studio that her husband built her in quarantine. There she is. It looks so hey, good. Monique. Thank you. Yeah. And Monique, good. I just have to affirm you in your recognition of the importance of cilantro in lime. <laughs> yes. Because yes. It, it's important. It really it's is. Good. And I'm, I, I, I get you. Yes. I get you. <laughs> so much yes. I made shrimp tacos and it was so much yes. So, so much, much yes. with the cilantro and lime. Ooh, and the yeah. butter. Yes. <laughs> a little garlic. Did you know that there are some people who taste cilantro and there's like a genetic thing where they actually taste soap? Have you heard of this? No. But I, mean, I feel I, very sad for those people. I know. I'm so, so, so glad I'm not one of those people. But I actually <laughs> know someone who, when they when they taste cilantro, it tastes like they're putting a bar of soap in their mouth. Ew. No. Oh, that's yeah. horrible. Yeah. No. That is... That's that's, that's really not nice. Mm-mm. I feel bad for their Taco Tuesdays. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we are excited to have Lisa Childers here. Some of you may recognize her from the film American Gospel. Your yes. uh, story was featured prominently in part two of that film. It's called Christ Crucified. And um, I'm going to, you're playing me. I hear my voice over there. Okay. So. <laughs> Oopsies. It's such a professional thing. Um, so we are excited to have you here. Elisa, for those uh, two people in the world who don't know who you are, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and um, the topic that you're interested in studying, your area of expertise. Well, I am probably the least likely apologist you could think of because I, I was in the artistic music world for most of my life. I was raised by a traveling musician and that's the the field I went into. So I was a part of the Christian pop group, Zoe Girl for many years. I don't know if many people remember Zoe Girl from the early, early 2000s, uh, but I spent quite a bit of time, close to a decade traveling the country and uh, just singing Christian pop songs for young girls. And gosh, as far back as I can remember, I have, loved Jesus and I've loved the Bible. My my parents, actually, I really feel blessed and fortunate that my parents modeled a really genuine Christianity for me. It wasn't just, it wasn't a hypocritical Christianity. It was uh, very real in the sense that they read and studied their Bibles with us, with each other, by themselves. We prayed together as a family, but not just that, but there was an element that they uh, brought to it where I was exposed to a lot of poverty growing up, homelessness, and uh, we did uh, street ministry. Sometimes it was evangelism. Sometimes it was working the soup lines at at the Fred Jordan Mission on Skid Row in LA. I grew up in LA. And so uh, 
my, my sort of entire perception of Christianity of Christians was that these were people who loved God. They loved people and they were just really committed to their beliefs and lived that out in service to other people. And so, you know, as we see all these deconstruction stories in our news feeds, um, I didn't have a reason to want to deconstruct. Everything about the gospel was beautiful to me. Everything about Christianity was beautiful to me. Uh, and that's not to, to say that it was a perfect uh, situation. It certainly wasn't. But just that that modeling out of that life of love for the Lord, repentance, consistency in prayer and Bible study and, and service to others was, was just beautiful to me. So it wasn't really until after I had left Zoe Girl and we had kind of uh, ended our run as a touring group and we'd all gotten married and we're starting to have kids. And I was invited to uh, be a part of a study group at a local church where my husband and I were living in, in Tennessee. And so it was in the context of this class that I was in that my faith was really challenged. We often hear the story of a Christian kid going off to college and getting their faith challenged by an, an atheist philosophy professor or uh, some kind of evolutionary biology class. And then their faith kind of crumbles and falls apart. And I have a similar story, only my faith challenge, my dark night of the soul didn't happen within the context of a classroom, but it happened in the pews of a church. And so the, the class was led by a pastor who identified himself as agnostic. And essentially he began to bring all these claims against everything I ever believed about God and Jesus and the Bible. And so while I was in the class with him, I, I would kind of try to fight with him. I would try to try to counter what he was saying, but it wasn't until I left the class that I found myself kind of isolated and, and the doubts that he had planted really took root. And so those doubts sort of grew and festered and essentially God used apologetics to help rebuild my faith. I, I went through my own type of process of deconstruction and, and then God helped me reconstruct through apologetics, through, you know, studying sound theology. That wasn't, uh, I hadn't really studied systematic theology or anything like that in my life, just read and read the Bible. And so, um, as I was rebuilding, I noticed that several years later, this church that I was in went on to identify itself as a progressive Christian community. And then I began to see that term all over the place, progressive Christianity, progressive Christianity. And then it dawned on me, oh, that's, that's kind of what that was all about. It's sort of this type of deconstruction where you're, you're deconstructing the Christian worldview, but still holding on to the title Christian, still wanting to associate with the Christian world and, and use some of that same language, but essentially at its foundational level, it's a completely different belief system. So I've spent the last few years really studying the movement and trying to figure out what they believe, trying to look at the history of it and, and try to figure out how to answer it biblically and how to untie some of the knots um, that I think are confusing some, some Christians that are being brought about by this movement. Let me, let me ask you some more about that because I'd love to um, help people understand, first of all, what some of the questions were that this pastor was covering in this class. Like, what were some of the key words or, or key topics that he was bringing up um, that played into that? I want to paint that picture a little bit more for people. Yeah, thank you for asking that. That's a good question. So in the beginning, essentially how the class worked is we would read through a book together over a week or two or three, depending how on how long the book was. And then we would come every week and discuss what we had read. And so the first book that he had us read was a book by Brian McLaren called A Generous Orthodoxy. I had never heard of Brian McLaren. Uh, I never heard of this book, but I was really excited to read it because this was something that the pastor, pastor had described as, man, if I could write a book, this would be the book I would write. And so, you know, I had um, already come to trust and respect this pastor. So I was really excited to read this book. But right off the bat, I was I was really conflicted about what I was reading because there were themes that were very subtle. There was nothing, uh, at least that I was able to discern at that point in my life, that was really overtly anti-Christian. But there was just a lot of stuff making me uncomfortable. There was the way things were being worded. Um, I, th I think I remember there was something in there where 
it talked about God being in Jesus. And I remember even bringing that to the pastor and saying, but Jesus is God. So God's not just in him. He is God. And so we kind of talked through some of that. And, and then Brian McLaren was bringing these ideas of basically taking the view of Jesus. He called this the seven Jesuses, the different views of Jesus from all the different streams of Christianity and sort of trying to bring them together uh, for a broader view of Jesus. And, and even that confused me because I remember thinking, well, I don't want to just mash together everybody's view of Jesus. I want to know who the real Jesus is. That's the Jesus I want to believe in. That's the Jesus I want to follow. And so that was sort of a real subtle beginning. But then we began to read books that challenged the historicity of the Old Testament. So we had discussions about whether or not Abraham really existed or whether or not David really existed, uh, whether or not Jesus really existed. And there were conversations, um, a lot of conversations surrounded the Bible. So there was discussions of problematic authorship, but this wasn't the time. If I could say, it, I don't think it was a really a fair portrayal because it was really all from the skeptical side. So we weren't just having discussions about, well, here's one view of the authorship and here's another view of the authorship of Matthew, say, or another gospel. It was always the skeptical view that was presented and that's the book we were reading. And, and so if you took a more historic view or traditional view or whatever you, whatever you wanna call it, you were definitely in the minority. So this was uh, very much a deconstruction of all of these types of things that we had believed in. We had discussions about the uh, the creeds that we would recite on Sunday. In fact, at this church at the time, they don't do this anymore, but at the time we would recite the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. But in class, uh, we would go through the points of the creeds and the pastor even one time went through and said, well, this one I actually believe in, and this one I don't, and this one I don't think matters. So there were discussions about the resurrection and the virgin birth and uh, just all the core tenets of Christianity, but there was no expectation about what you really needed to believe to be called a Christian. It was just all, it was all fair game. And what? so uh, there were people in the class who affirmed the resurrection and there were those who didn't, and, and that was all okay. And but, so I think that was a, a really uh, destabilizing, uh, it had a destabilizing effect on me because I just, I felt like I was just drowning. I, I didn't know where to turn for answers. I didn't really know how to answer these claims at the time. But that's kind of one of the features of progressive Christianity that I've run into is that it's almost, um, it feels like nearly everything that you thought you believed is now being <laughs> redefined or minimized or called unimportant but, or really subtle so yeah. it's more like well we're not saying that this is completely false but here's another way to look at it or have yeah. you considered this and so i feel like it gives you that back door to any questions that you may have that really kind of just bring you all the way into another worldview hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. In fact, just a perfect sort of practical example of this is that several years after I left that church, the children's pastor from that church wrote a blog post that got kind of a bit of attention about how to talk to your kids about Easter. And in the blog post, she basically made the point that, you know, we don't want to traumatize kids by telling them that Jesus died for their sins. We don't, you know, she, she actually believed that would be psychologically damaging to tell kids that that message. And she she even said like, we don't need to make them be thinking about somebody dying and coming back to life because we know people don't come back to life. So we don't wanna scare them. So maybe have discussions with your kids that maybe it doesn't matter if something really happened in history, but what can we learn from the story? And so that, that was a very common approach. It's like not an outright denial of the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but hey, let's put whether or not it really happened aside, let's think more about the moral story we can learn from, uh, just from, from knowing about that story. I think um, maybe you can paint us a picture even more of like, just give us four or five names of big authors or conference speakers or people that are in this stream that maybe our, our listeners might encounter. Sure. Well, there's there's sort of two um, 
approaches that the major progressive thought leaders were take. So there's there's the more theological where they know the Bible, they're they're writing books that have real theological bents. And then there's kind of the more secularized, self-helpish kind of uh, movement. They're all in unity together, but they sort of present a different face. So on the more theological side of things, you're going to find people like Pete Enns, Brian McLaren, uh, Rachel Held Evans when she was still alive. Uh, uh, people like Marcus Borg and uh, Spong and some of the Jesus Seminar scholars have informed a lot of the ideas within the movement of progressive Christianity, because essentially it really goes back to the German scholarship of the early 1900s, and it's sort of pro proliferated from there, and they're taken on several different forms, but this is kind of the current form of it now. So there's sort of the more theological side where they're going to really present sophisticated arguments that change the definition of the inspiration of scripture, of the authority of scripture, of how to view the scriptures. And then there's sort of this more popularized version of it that's mobilizing a lot of people uh, for activism and things like that. Um, and on that side of things, you're going to have uh, like the Jen Hat makers, you're going to have the Rachel Hollis's, although I think she's now going in a bit of a more secular uh, sort of direction. Um, but but there are names like, um, I'm trying to think just off the top of my head, um, more again, more of the theological would be like a Brian Zond, uh, William Paul Young, who wrote the book, The Shack, that so many people in the Christian world loved. Um, he went on to write a theological treatise called Lies We Believe About God. And in that book, he writes that it's a lie to believe that our sin separates us from God or uh, that, you know, that he denies original sin. He, he denies that there's anyone going to go to hell in any kind of meaningful sense. And so there, there is a more theological bent and there's more of a popularized kind of uh, expression of it as well. So some of their key beliefs, maybe if I can, because, uh, um, you know, we're already getting questions, so I'm going to kind of... Uh, I want to kind of tell you my impression of, of some key beliefs of progressive Christianity. And, and maybe you can give me, you know, some feedback about that. Um, one of the things that I think I hear them say a lot is sort of redefining the doctrine of inerrancy, you know, that the Bible is not the error free word of God. They don't necessarily go along with the Chicago statement on right. inerrancy. Um, another critical belief is, this idea of Jesus dying on the cross, you'll often hear them talk about it as being cosmic child abuse. Why would the father make the son um, die for the sins of, of the world? That that is an example of cosmic child abuse. Another thing that you often, that I, I think I hear progressives say is um, they're very focused on loving people, which sounds really great and noble. They'll often say, well, Christianity is just about love God, love people, which technically I, I have some issues with that. Um, but it it sounds very pretty. Um, but then when you get into the nuts and bolts of how that shows up, it, it can really start to redefine things. Yeah, because it looks like, oh, I can't call you out on your sin. And not to say that we just call people out, but we can't address things like sin or error or um, inerrancy in scripture or, you know, um, like heresy, I guess I would say, as um, more than inerrancy. But, you know, we can't say, oh, you know, maybe you should rethink this. Maybe the way that you're considering this isn't um, actually scriptural. Scriptural. I also think that um, it comes along with the postmodern mindset, though, like my truth. And, Absolutely. you know, who are you to call me out on something? Maybe we can get you to react to some of that, those Sorry, impressions. Is that kind of where, 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 where you see some of this going? Yeah, no, you both, you both characterized that perfectly. Uh, Krista, you're absolutely right. It's, I mean, the inerrancy of scripture is not even a conversation in the progressive uh, world anymore. Um, I don't know of, what, other than Matthew Vines, who wrote the book, um, uh, God and the Gay Christian, I think is what it's called. He says he affirms inspiration, uh, in inerrancy. 
in that book. And I think the reason he says that is because he's basically trying to make a biblical case for uh, same-sex marriage and, and LGBT, what they call inclusion. Um, but among the major progressive thought leaders, and I've read their books, I listen to their podcasts and read their blogs, uh, it's not even a discussion uh, among most of them. I, and very few, I think, would even say, I believe the Bible is inerrant. Um, that sort of a bygone conversation. Even by the time I was in my class at the Progressive Church, I remember the pastor even saying one time about inerrancy, like even our high schoolers aren't buying that anymore. I mean, that's just like got long gone. So what the discussion is more about is really like, what does it mean when we say the Bible is inspired? And so often you'll hear progressives say, yeah, absolutely. The Bible is inspired by God, but they mean it on a different level. They mean it in a different way. So they might say, well, what we're doing right now, God's inspiring, right? We're, we're speaking about God. We're talking about God. We're inspired by God to say these things. And so they'll bring the Bible down to that type of level of inspiration. There, there are not a lot of progressive Christians who would say the Bible is the word of God. It might contain the word of God uh, here and there. It might become the word of God to you if something makes sense to you. Um, but, but even in Rachel Held Evans' book called Inspired, talking about the Bible, she even said it's really a sign of a mature spiritual person to be able to take the stories the Bible tells and separate, she says, fact from fiction, truth from untruth. She says God has given us a conscience, a God-given conscience to be able to do that with scripture. And if we don't do that, then we're essentially just going to be swept up into cults and things like that. And, and so there, there's this sense that, you know, Inerrancy, no, surely the Bible, according to the progressive view, has a lot of contradictions, and you've got to decide which bits and pieces of it are telling the truth and which ones aren't. But again, also, like you mentioned, Krista, the, the atonement, that's something that is largely seen as um, not just something that they would deny, but something that they would see as morally repugnant, the idea that God as father would require the blood sacrifice of his only son, uh, that to them, that's Michael Gunger called that on Twitter, absolutely horrific. He says that's not a beautiful story. It's a horrific story. And uh, that's that's just beneath, morally beneath who they believe God is. And uh, other, other things, you know, of course, if you take the atonement away, that's going to affect your whole view of the gospel, right? Because of course, Christians have historically seen the gospel being the proclamation of the good news, right? Well, what is the good news? A huge part of that is that Jesus died for my sins, that I was dead in my sins and I can be alive to Christ. There's also, um, you know, that that Jesus is the king of this kingdom that he's building and, and we submit to his lordship and his, and his kingdom. And so a lot of times in the progressive world, view, they'll emphasize more that kingdom view. Uh, and now I don't want to get this conflated with, there's like this debate going on among evangelicals over what the emphasis should be kingdom or atonement. I'm kind of not talking about that so much because the progressive gospel of the kingdom is even a completely different gospel than what that debate is about. If anyone's aware of that debate, I just didn't want you to think that's what I was talking about. But the progressive view of the gospel of the kingdom really has more to do with political activism. It has to do with bringing heaven to earth here in the here and the now. In fact, Brian McLaren says this is, uh, we're going to do like green energy reform, socioeconomic reform. This has to do with environmentalism and, and uh, speaking, you know, truth to the systems of oppression that are, are oppressing people. And then, of course, as Christians, the book of James talks about faith without works is dead. So, of course, we want to do good things in the world. We want to stand up for the oppressed. We want to do all of those things. But historically, Christians have viewed the gospel, the good news, to be salvation from our sin, the redemption of the world from the powers of sin and death. And so um, there's this sort of mix uh, in the progressive world that it's really more about political activism because it's not about the next life. It's really not about heaven and hell. It's about the here and now. And so there's going to be a lot of a, a real... Um, sort of push and a real pressure to do a lot of activism because essentially that's their gospel. And, and, it, and, and as I see it, that's, that's a workspace gospel that's earning and that's striving. And if you don't, you know, if you don't submit to the right causes, then you're not doing it right. And there's just this, all this striving, this workspace gospel that I think 
um, is, is what the Bible talks about. That's not grace. Grace is, I deserve sin and death, but Jesus gives me life and healing and hope and adopts me and redeems me. And um, which to those of us who know that we're sinners is a really beautiful story. Woo, girl, you preaching now. If we was in okay. black church, I'd have to fan you. Yes, I would. I would fan okay, you. I'll take it. Yes. We talk a lot on our show about critical theory and critical race theory. Yeah. And even though I wanted to ask this question much more down the road, but you hit on it so much now. It's just like busting in my gut. I see so many people who are in the social justice movement, who are social justice warriors, completely enmeshed in this progressive theology yeah. They're and, almost like sister movements. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if they're sister movements. I wonder if it's the same one in the same. And Kimba mm-hmm. asked a good question on the the YouTube stream. She says, um, wait, that's Keisha. Sorry. No, Kimba said, anyone know if this was a precursor to communism in the past? And I'm like, mm, it, it all kind of these social movements and progressive theology, I wonder like how they're all enmeshed and intertwined even spiritually. But yeah. yes, with the whole critical theory, the works, we call it um, Jesus plus yeah. because that's what this progressive mentality includes. And this, this progressive doctrine, especially when you enter into the social justice world, it becomes yeah. Jesus plus all the work that I have to do in order for all me the to activism be activism. Yeah. In yeah. order for me to really be saved in order for me to really know that I'm, that I am doing what's right and that I am loved by God. And if I loved God, then I would do X, Y, and Z. I have to speak out. I have to be an anti-racist. Yeah. I have to do this. I have to do that. Jesus plus. So yes. Well, and Elisa might not know a little bit about your story is that you've been working and advocating for social justice and critical race theory for the last two decades and are now kind of coming out of that. So two decades sounds like a long time. But it wow. like no, I didn't know that. that. But people. similar yeah. to Elisa's story of sort of coming out of progressive Christianity, you're coming out of critical theory and critical yeah, race theory. And that and whole deconstruction of you've you know, been going your through paradigm your own, shifts and all of that. Some deconstruction yeah. of your own in that. So. Yeah, but no, I just I agree in it. It so resonates when you say that, you know, progressivism is this other gospel that includes all of these other things, that social justice mentality, that works mentality. It really is a theology of work. It's not a theology of grace because you really are um, inundated with the things that you have to do in in the, the process of advocating for someone else, in the process of helping the poor. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't help the poor. That doesn't mean that the, the scriptures don't talk about helping the poor. But it's not the foundation of our salvation. Yeah. Well, and that's, I'm so intrigued that you brought that up because I just wrote a book on progressive Christianity, which is coming out in the fall. And I had written yeah, we the have that whole... graphic. So I'll have Bob put oh, it good. up for you while you're talking. I want to encourage okay. everyone to go pre order Elisa's book right now on, on Amazon, um, Another Gospel. So it's already there and, and available for pre-order. So yeah, yeah tell us there about it is. that. Yeah, you can pre-order it now. That'd be great. But I had I had written the book, completely written it. And over the year that I wrote it, I started to see, well, as I became more educated on what uh, critical theory and critical race theory, intersectionality and all that stuff was, I began to see it grow in the progressive movement like I mean, like l- lightning fast, like it just like caught fire to where people who were maybe just starting to say, maybe I affirm same sex marriage, then all of a sudden it's like full on critical race theory is all you hear from their platforms now. And so I actually asked my publisher, can I please put a little section somewhere in the book about critical theory? Because I think that this is a huge part of uh, progressive Christianity. I think it's an on-ramp too. There are a lot of different on-ramps, but I think critical theory, intersectionality, all that stuff is a huge on-ramp because generally, I mean, people want to do good things, right? All of us, we want to see justice done. We all do. But the problem is that often justice gets defined culturally rather than biblically. And so in order to be uh, in in the justice movement, you have to, for example, you, you would not be able to affirm biblical sexuality. You would be considered hateful. You would be considered harmful as a person. You would be considered a bigot. And so you you have to affirm the the 
world's definition of justice to even be accepted in that paradigm. But that has largely become the progressive gospel. And we're seeing that more on the, I talked about the two wings, like the, the more popular uh, wing. That's that's like Jen Hatmaker, uh, Glennon Doyle, Rachel Hollis. A, a lot of these platforms now are just uh, shouting this message. And um, I think it, it's it's very confusing for a lot of people, especially women who have followed their ministries for, for so many years. Well, I think you're raising a really important point. Ooh. I know she's like, you. <laughs> let me fail <laughs> you. Come on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cause this is, this is exactly now you're, you're in Monique's mm. uh, uh, wheelhouse because one of the points that we've been making in our, we, we have a series of videos that we've done on race conversations and critical race theory and, trying to help Christians do kind of similar what you've done on progressive Christianity, helping people understand critical race theory. And I'll just tell people a little aside, um, the interview that you did with Neil Shenvey last year, uh, I remember vividly where I was when I listened to that for the first time, absolutely changed my life because I had been in all these conversations with Monique and I couldn't figure out what is she talking about? I have mm. never heard anybody talk this way. And then I listened to your interview with Neil Shenvey and it, man, it just clicked in my head in 45 minutes and I was just never the same. And then I couldn't unsee it. And then all of the, the discussions with Monique finally like made sense. I had a paradigm to understand what she was telling me. And I'm like, you have to stop whatever you're doing right now and go listen to this podcast. Because and I said, no. And she said, no, she told me no for six months. She was like, I don't care who this guy is. I'm not listening to him. I don't know who this Elisa person is, but I'm not listening. At least I'm committed. And I I kept sending her all these links to to Neil's things. And I was devouring all this stuff because I'm trying to figure out. I was so caught off guard and off balance by all of this. But when you had that podcast, I'm like, okay, now there's sort of an anchor for me. And I ended up reaching out to Pat Sawyer, who is Neil's intellectual partner. Oh. And um, he was the one who I got Monique to talk to him. <laughs> and he kind of came alongside her and helped her. And wow. and um, so you played a really big role in our journey together and helping bring Monique out of critical race theory. Uh, through through that podcast and right when I was praying for her to come and see Jesus in the light (laughs) yeah she was she was literally praying that I would repent from not believing in social justice and she was having an argument with the Lord and the Lord tells her she has to repent we didn't you don't need to go all that far we don't have to put we don't need to tell some things some some things are not a family discussion some you, you've said just, that in public. Holly, <laughs> no, I have. And it's true. It so is true. It, it just is a, it's been a crazy road for us the last 14 months. But one of the things, um, and sorry to interrupt, but one no, of the sorry. things that you said um, is like, we all desire to do good. And that's what I call like being born in his image. We're created in his image. And just like, you know, I don't have kids, but you guys have kids and your kids look like you. I think those are the things that make us look like God. You know, like this desire to do good, even the atheist does, wants to do good, um, unless they have maybe a mental thing, you know, whatever. But people want to do good. But then when we want to do good without knowing the heart and the mind of God, without really seeking out, okay, God, what was your heart behind this law? What was your mind behind that? And even though the word says that, you know, like, who can know the mind of God? It also says that the Holy Spirit will reveal those things to us. So there is a little bit of of give and take there. But I think that when, when we as his children created in his image, want to do that good that you're talking about, that's us being created in his image. And there's nothing wrong with that, but things tend to go askew or a little off trail when we don't understand completely the heart and mind of God and what he's really getting after when he sets something in motion. So social justice, yes, he is for justice. He really Mm -hmm. is. But what does that look like in his heart and his mind? I don't know. That's just what what, what you were saying made me think about. Well, and Elisa Mm -hmm. just hit it right on the head. I mean, you and I have made that point so many times that 
so many in the church today are defining justice according to the culture. They're mm-hmm. defining it according to critical theory. And the question that you and I keep asking, and I'm going to have my live stream on Tuesday is going to be a part one on this, is how does God define justice? What yeah. is his heart for justice? And what does that begin to look like? Because, and what makes it so confusing is there are places of overlap, and then there's other places where yeah. we have two completely different ideas of, of what this is. And yeah. so I think that, Elisa, your your project really is, in some ways, the intellectual genesis of so many things that Monique and I are doing now. Yeah. And yeah. you you really have no idea the the role that you played in 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 just in our own journey and and helping me, giving me an anchor, and using your story because I want to talk about that like. Part of your story is after you started deconstructing your faith, then you had to reconstruct your faith. Now, some yeah. people deconstruct and their faith just gets shattered. They never return. And they ne- they, they kind of slip into agnosticism. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about your journey of reconstructing your faith and what that looked like. Like what kept you from agnosticism even? Yeah, well, you know, if I'm really honest, there were probably moments where I was agnostic, you know, and it just, I didn't want to be. I never wanted to be. So there were moments of almost like what you heard the term cognitive dissonance, where I believe it's, it's like that scene. I I related so deeply with the scene in the gospels where the father comes to Jesus and his son is being just horrendously abused by this demonic possession, this demon that throws him into the fire and into the water, tries to kill him. And this father's absolutely desperate. And he asks Jesus to heal his son. And and Jesus says something to him along the lines of, you know, if, you know, if I, if I can, or if I will, you know, do I I forget the wording exactly. I don't have it right in front of me, but he asks him if he believes. And the father says, I believe help my unbelief. And I felt like that was the best description of where I was at in my darkest moments. I believe help my unbelief. I mean, I have unbelief and I believe at the same time. And so as, as my faith deconstructed, I I think the darkest moments were, there was this physical darkness too. I was, I would be rocking my daughter to sleep at night in the rocking chair. And, uh, I I just would sing hymns into the darkness and it was 100% by faith because I didn't even know if any of that was true anymore. And, and I would just cry and I would just sing these hymns. And I remember asking the Lord to help me. And I remember just praying like, God, if you're there, if you exist, if you're real, please send me a lifeboat because I'm absolutely drowning. I felt totally alone. I didn't know any Christians who could answer the claims that this pastor had brought up. And I was just drowning. And so I was, I was like, God, please send me somebody I can talk to, please. And I didn't even know really that the claims that he brought up that there was anybody that could actually answer those because I wasn't really exposed to any sort of intellectual Christianity growing up. Like I said, I had wonderful parents, um, but nothing was real. Like it was, it was the type of denomination that was a little loose uh, in the hermeneutic side of things. And I just didn't know, I, I didn't know how to answer this stuff. Everything was like, basically I would feel God in the church services I grew up in. And that was, all the evidence I needed. But then when this guy was able to sort of knock the legs out from under the Bible and knock the legs out from under even my own confidence and what I was sensing in those moments, I just felt the dark, just darkness. And so I was driving in my car one day and I was fiddling with the radio and I heard this voice and he, it was this man that was at a college campus and he was answering questions from I mean, some of them were kind of friendly questions, but most of them were from agnostics and they were from atheists and they were, and I was just like so tense. I heard these questions. I was like, oh my gosh, how is he going to answer these questions? And then this guy just calmly and completely just confidently, charitably, kindly started. And I mean, he answered every question as if it were the 10,000th time he'd heard the question. And so at the, I, w- I was listening to the broadcast and I was praying like, please say his name. So I know who this person is. Cause I need to find this person. And it was Ravi Zacharias. And so as I, I I went home, I Googled Ravi Zacharias and I found out he had an app. I started listening. I listened to Ravi every day for a year. 
then through his ministry, I found other apologists and, and uh, ministries. And so for many years, I, I studied apologetics and God used Southern Evangelical Seminary. I mean, I audited classes at Southern Evangelical Seminary because I don't have a degree. I never, I, I pretty much skipped college. I did a few classes at uh, community college, but I didn't have any undergrad or anything. So they let me audit these classes and they answered my questions. They were patient. They let me participate in the debate forum with other students and at, through SES and through Ravi's ministry, Norm Geisler and uh, other apologetics ministries that I found, God started answering all the questions that I had, questions that I didn't think we had answers to. And so it was really just it was, it was to the point where it wasn't just that my questions were answered, but I almost felt like so ripped off. Like, why did nobody tell me any of this stuff before? Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know these questions existed, <laughs> yes. let alone that there's these great answers. Yes. And so, yeah, so it was, it was apologetics that God used to, to really rebuild my faith. I never dreamed that I would have an apologetics ministry. Um, but I, I do remember about half, you know, I'd just begun studying apologetics and I read this blog post I don't think I've ever shared this story publicly. So this is new with you guys. Um, but I, I was on Facebook and I read this blog post and I didn't know who this person was at the time, but it was by Sarah Bessie. And I remember reading it and all my friends were just going nuts over this blog post. They, they were sharing it all over. And I remember just reading it and going, I know there's something about this that feels wrong to me, but I don't, I don't know how to articulate it. Like, I don't think I could ever write a response to, to articulate what I think is wrong with this blog post. And I just felt overwhelmed and frustrated and defeated. And I, that was, that was a moment where I really believe God called me to apologetics because this, it, it's like all in one moment, I just felt strengthened and buoyed up. And it was like, study you, you, you can, you can answer it. And that's when I really dug my heels in and started just every waking moment, listening to lectures and reading books and doing everything I could to educate myself, yeah. never dreaming that I would be able to write articles that would answer some of these things. And so I'm, I'm really thankful to God for that. That's such a good story. That is. Yeah. That's uh, it. And it's so, so similar in some ways of the journey I've seen Monique on is I remember in the beginning, I took her to the rethink conference two years ago here in Southern <laughs> California. And she had, she had just started uh, living with us and she didn't know anything about apologetics. She'd never heard the word apologetics, but at the time um, there was some situations where she had to come with me. And so she was there for, for two days with me at the um, stand a reason uh, rethink youth conference. She's like, what is this? I have <laughs> yeah. never heard talks like this. Who are these? She says, these people sound like you. They talk like you. You mean there's more of a people like this than you? And I was like, I thought yeah, she was so weird. There's a, there's a whole subculture lie. of us. Yeah, oh, yeah. So what in the what, what? Yeah, this? yeah. <laughs> yes. And she was yeah. like, I've never heard this. But then slowly over time, you know, just starting to realize like, wow, there's a lot more to my faith than I ever realized. And why has nobody ever I think brought that's this it. up? I think that it's like- You went to Biola. I did. <laughs> I did. I was also like a sociology major at Biola, so there's some other things. But <laughs> I think it's, it's that part. Like, why is no one talking about this in the pews? Like, how could I have been in church for so long and not realize that there are answers to some of these questions and that we can talk about, you know, the atonement or we can talk about, I don't know, it, a lot of these things and actually have answers for people who are asking and don't have to say, oh, well, uh, I don't know. Or, you know, I haven't really thought about that. Like people were actually thinking about these things, questions that I felt would be taboo to even ask in church. Yeah. So, yes. And what a wonderful tribute to Ravi Zacharias, you know, here mm -hmm. on the week when he g went to heaven and got his reward is just such a, such a great tribute that we're doing this show, you know, and, and the impact that, that he had on, mm -hmm. on you, Elisa, and so many people are just, I, I've just been so overwhelmed by the amount of tributes that people have done for Ravi, just all walks of life. Even the president's press secretary this week mm -hmm. was saying how Ravi had influenced, influenced her. So 
he was a friend of the ministry that I work for. Um, we had a lot of great events together and it's just, it's a huge loss. I'm, I'm wondering, Elisa, as, as people are sitting in their pews, what are some of the, the things that they should be listening for? Or if they start hearing their pastor talk like this or retweeting these people that they might be alerted that progressive theology may be guiding some of the pastoral leadership. Well, what, one of the hallmarks of progressive Christianity is going to be their view of the Bible. So we kind of talked a little earlier about historically, I mean, Christians have argued over the nuances of what we mean by inerrancy. We've argued about a lot of things, but throughout history, going back to the earliest form of Christianity, uh, if we look at the earliest creed, which Paul records for us in 1 Corinthians 15, that's representative of the earliest iteration of Christianity. Even real skeptical scholar Bart Ehrman will tell you this is what the earliest Christians believed. And that is that Jesus died for our sins. And then it says in accordance with the scriptures. Now, that's a big statement when you think about the fact that the Old Testament scriptures prophesied the Messiah that would die for our sins. That if you read Isaiah 53, that the sins of the world would be laid upon him. This is like Christianity 101 in its earliest form. And then that he was buried and that he was resurrected. And then again, it says in accordance with the scriptures. So there's this sense that there's these core things that Paul said, this is the most important thing. This is of utmost importance that Jesus died for our sins in accordance of the, of, uh, with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. And so you can't separate true Christianity from those facts of Jesus dying, not just at the hands of an angry mob, not just because he wanted to show us the way forward for forgiveness, but he died for our sins. And this has to do with the scriptures, which you can reference back to Isaiah 53, which Jesus said in the upper room that that prophecy was about him. And so you just cannot separate Christianity from that. So when you start to hear things like cosmic child abuse or you know, requiring God requiring the blood of his only son makes him out to be some kind of divine child abuser. Any kind of talk that sort of lowers the view of the atonement to be something other than Jesus taking the penalty of our sins upon himself, that the iniquity of the world was laid upon him. Anything that softens that, moves away from it, or is ashamed of that is going or to be Or even is ashamed of sin. I think that's yeah. another thing of downplaying sin and... Yeah. That's part of it. And also another common phrase I hear a lot is they'll redefine the kingdom so that, you know, they'll say, well, everyone's a child of God. Everyone's a precious child of God. And it's like, well, no, wait a minute. You have to be in a covenant relationship with God in order to be considered his child. But they'll, they use kind of biblical terms, but then subtly redefine it. And that can also be part of that atonement undermining. Exactly. And uh, Jay Gresham Machen had a wonderful chapter in his book, Christianity and Liberalism. If anybody wants to kind of understand what's going on with this movement, this is just part two of what happened in the early 1900s. And he was writing at that time. And it, it, back then, I think they called it the brotherhood of all mankind. And it's this idea that everyone's a child of God. Everyone has a seat at the table. So progressive Christianity is going to be very pluralistic in that they're not going to want to tell someone of another faith that they've got it wrong. So progressive Christian is going to accept a Buddhist, a Muslim, uh, in the sense that not just accepting them as a person, but they're not going to tell them they're wrong. They're, there's going to be this sense in which everybody's got kind of their own path to God, but it's all going to the same place. But all of this, all of the, the ideas that you're going to see come up in your progressive church are going to be based on how they're looking at the Bible. If they don't view the Bible as the authoritative, inspired word of God, that and, and what that means is that when the prophets in the Old Testament said, thus saith the Lord, or God said to Moses, or I mean, just read Leviticus and, and over and over and over and over again, you, you see God said to Moses or God spoke through Moses they would say, well, that, that wasn't really God speaking through Moses or through Isaiah or through those other prophets. That was just their best idea of 
who they thought God was in their time and place. So essentially, rather than the Bible being the authoritative word of God, it's more like an ancient spiritual travel journal that we can look back and read, oh, that's what the ancient Israelites thought about God in their time and place. But we might have a different idea of God in our time and place. And so because they sort of do that bait and switch, they can still say, oh, I have such a high view of scripture because they actually believe they're reading it as it's meant to be read, which is more like this ancient spiritual travel journal. So that's something to really look for is a lowered view of scripture. Anytime uh, you might hear uh, someone say, well, this prophet disagreed with this prophet, but Jesus took the side of this prophet. Anything that pits the Bible against itself or Jesus against the Bible is going to be a huge sign that the church is sort of heading in that direction. We're getting a ton of questions on the chat and I want to start working my way through some of them. Hold on, hold on one okay. second. Just hold before it. we get to the questions, um, Christina Miller on Facebook wrote something that is so beautiful. She said, one of the first podcasts I ever listened to was Elisa's about 18 months ago. There was a couple episodes from a speaking gig she did in Alaska, I think, um, where she was talking about Rachel Hollis's book that introduced me to her ministry. Her podcast helped me make a 180 degree um, from dabbing in progressive Christianity to studying historic Christianity and apologetics with every spare moment. So thankful for Elisa. That's awesome. Yes. I echo that. Thank you for that. Yes. So Elisa, one question, our friend Amy Davis was asking um, early on uh, in the show. I think it's a really great question to pick up right now is, why do progressive Christians still call themselves Christians? Like what keeps them in the faith if they start saying, well, you know, I'm not really sure about those early chapters of Genesis. That might all be mythology or I'm not really sure about, you know, the, the atonement. I'm not really sure about the virgin birth. Um, does the resurrection really have to be literally true? Like, so what keeps them? Why do they continue to call themselves Christians? Well, that's an interesting question. I think that there there are different reasons. I think there one thing that we have to understand about progressive Christianity is that it's a movement that's largely it's a movement that's reacting to something else. So the progressive Christians are almost entirely ex-evangelical. So they're people who grew up in the evangelical church. They've rejected uh, what, whatever their experience was in the evangelical church, they're walking away from that. And I think that the reason so many still use the moniker Christian is because there is something in them that connects, that wants to stay connected with Jesus, that, that want in their minds, whatever they went through, whether it was abuse or maybe a really legalistic environment that they grew up in, um, or maybe they're trying to find a way to make cultural morality fit with Christianity. So they, they want the Jesus part of the story, but they also don't want to have to tell, uh, you know, the world that, that, well, the Bible kind of has this to say about sexuality. So they want to hang on to certain elements of Christianity. And then there's another sort of attitude that's even a little more aggressive about it. And what's really interesting, I know we don't have a ton of time left, but I just read Glennon Doyle's book, Untamed. It's the number one book in the country right now across all platforms and genres. This isn't just a Christian book, but she is, comes from the Christian blogging world. And she basically in this book, tells you how to be your own God. She teaches a very pantheistic view of, of the nature of God, that we're all part of this ocean that we're just gathered up into buckets into these bodies, but eventually we'll be poured back into the ocean where we'll all be together again. And there's just sort of this, this it's really, really anti-Christian. But then she has this whole chapter on critical race theory, and it is breathtakingly specific, all of the instructions that she has about how to, how to, you know, go about this particular type of activism. And then toward, uh, after that, she claims like, I don't know if I really call myself a Christian anymore, but I'm not going to let go of that because I think that the, the white, you know, this, this white men, these middle-aged white men have hijacked Christianity. So I'm not going to let them have it. And so for her, maintaining the Christian title really is rooted out of her critical race theory, which is a whole other interesting. That's a fascinating of, right? <laughs> situation there. Yeah. So yeah. You now um, people may not know her. What's the name of her blog? It's a really famous blog. Momastery. Momastery. That's it. And 
So she used to be kind of in the, you know, evangelical world. And then she and her husband got divorced a few years ago. And now she's a lesbian and she's with yeah. the famous soccer player. Um, Abby Wambach. Yeah. Yeah. Abby Wam Wambach. Yeah. And, you know, now she's promoting pantheism. It's, it's a fascinating journey. But I think that what ends up happening for a lot of these ex-evangelicals is that it does slowly kind of erode their faith and then they end up somewhere else and they, they don't even realize it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it's, it's a sad situation, but the hope for me is in stories like your story, Elisa and Monique's story that reconstructing your faith in, in, Orthodox Christianity, in historic Christianity, as I like to call it, um, you know, if you can get beyond that, the whole white man hijacking theology narrative is just not even rooted and grounded in historical reality. And that was a big help for for Monique in her own journey. Yeah, the idea of colonialism. And, yeah, you know, I think you've got that. a question. I can tell by the look on your face. Well, <laughs> I was just thinking like, you know, I, yeah, I can see people deconstructing their faith, evangelicals leaving evangelicalism for more progressivism, but it seems like there's more women who are doing it. Is that just because there's more women in the church in general? Or like, does progressive theology just have like a special inroad into women's ministries and something? I don't know. Like why? Is there an appeal, yeah, there? Is there an appeal to, to women's more specifically? It would be interesting to know the numbers. I because in in my world I see I see it pretty equal. I see a lot. I mean, there are a lot of male progressive Christians who, in fact, the ones that sort of oppose me more openly on social media are usually men. Interestingly, um, but I do think there's sort of this niche for women because the whole idea of the internet and social media and all these communities that people have built online. Um, are incredibly appealing to women. So uh, a couple years ago, when I reviewed Rachel Hollis's book, um, Girl, Wash Your Face, I was doing some research to try to figure out, you know, more about her and, and what she's about. So I went on her Facebook page and I mean, she's got this community of women who tune in every morning to watch her Facebook live. She connects with them. She's very interactive on there. And if you look around, that's really going on in a lot of places. It's, you see it with Jen Hatmaker, you see it with Glennon Doyle. So, so they built these communities online where Women, you know, let's face it, as women, when we have young babies, it's an isolating time of life. Yeah. And you're not, a, you know, you, you're, you're home with this kid a lot and you're craving adult uh, interaction and especially interaction with other women who might understand what you're going through. And uh, especially when somebody's funny and they can crack a joke that just hits right at the heart of what you're going through as a mom, which, you know, of course, Jen Hatmaker is brilliant at that. So they built these communities. And then as they've drifted into progressive Christianity, Christianity, they've taken a lot of people, a lot of women with them, I think, because, and, the, and this is like, I hear this all the time, especially people continue to follow Jen Hatmaker and people like hers, but she's so funny. And it's because they relate with the humor and it's because they, they get a little comic relief from her that they continue to follow her. But as she's gone down a deeper path of uh, critical theory, cr critical race theory, uh, promoting Richard Rohr and some of his, you know, really heretical ideas about theology. These women are getting swept up, I think, in, in that. And it's all because of this phenomenon of the social media platform. That's a really good mm -hmm. point, because I think that, and, and I'm glad you're continuing to bring more names in it, because people yeah. might might have heard of Richard War. They, they might, yeah. um, maybe Rob Bell is another person that's oh, in yeah. the, the progressive stream. Um, and so just to, to get these names, Rachel Hollis, Jen Hatmaker. Now, Jen Hatmaker, had the situation a few years ago. And I think this is important to bring up. And one of, I think the key features of progressive theology is the redefinition or the kind of inclusion of LG, the LGBT community. And when Jen Hatmaker came out and kind of said that, that same sex marriage could be holy um, in that one interview, I mean, that, I mean, overnight Lifeway uh, deplatformed her and yeah. uh, stopped selling her, um, books. And I think that what's important for people to understand 
is the connection between critical theory and progressive theology. Because in critical theory, what starts off is like, well, I want to be a stand for justice and racial equality, which are good things, and have some rooting and grounding in scripture. One of the things that Monique and I keep talking about is that critical theory is like a train with a lot of cars behind it. And maybe that first car is critical race theory. And you think, yeah, I want to be a stand for racial equality and justice. But what they don't understand is the next car in behind, right behind it is feminist theory and then queer yeah. theory. And then you start getting into, you know, all of these other emerging realms of critical theory. And th you, you can't just isolate one thing. It's all it's it's a train and it's going to go forward. And so this is exactly what we see playing out in progressive Christianity. Absolutely. That that is so absolutely well put. It I have you know because people will say about Jen Hatmaker, what's her, what's the big deal? She's changed her mind on one theological issue and everybody's jumping all over her like, you know, like she's this heretic. But what they fail to understand when they see that is exactly what you have just described, we've seen that happen with her. It's that was the first domino to fall. And then right behind that one is, is critical race there. Well, feminism. I mean, I'm, I'm currently reading her brand new book. It's just steeped and soaked in feminism. And, and, you know, she comes from that critical race theory too. She's been promoting that quite a bit, even more uh, as of, as of late. And, and so it's never just that. And it's always a, a slippery slope. I mean, I know that's a cliche to say that, but it's always a slippery slope into other things. And it never ends uh, before there's just, there's just denial of core doctrines of the faith. Now, I think personally, I argue, and I have a blog post on this, that to affirm uh, same-sex marriage is to deny the gospel because you're redefining sin, but you can read my blog post to see about that. But even if that were the only thing, it never just stops there. Um, now she's promoting Richard Rohr and Glennon Doyle, who are absolutely preaching a absolute new age pantheistic. Uh, in fact, Richard Rohr is openly panentheistic. Right. And he's a perennialist who believes that all religious systems come from the same source and that and he's a universalist. And that's, you know, it, it never, ever is just the one thing. And like you said, it's a train with lots and lots of cars that are coming right behind it, which, you know, is that's not the reason we should uphold biblical morality. We should uphold biblical morality because it reflects the nature and the heart of God. Exactly. But, but yeah. it's, but it's never just that one thing. It's always, there's always a train behind it. And then we, I think Jen Hatmaker is a perfect example of watching that play out in someone's life. Yeah. I mean, you go from Jen Hatmaker being on the women of faith tour, and now she wants to turn marriage into an agree to disagree issue. Yet the greatest little, um, quote this morning on your social media feed. In fact, I gave it to my husband of, uh, it's a, the graphic. It was a picture, um, of about redefining when you redefine sin, you end up redefining the gospel. And that strikes at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. I think that's such an important point that people need to, to uh, understand. Okay. Monique's going to do a question here. Well, I think that Susanna, um, poses a, a good question. Um, and I'm wondering your take on it. She says, I am a bit concerned of whitewashing all progressives as heretical. So that makes me think of the question, is orthodoxy and progressivism always at odds? Or is it possible to be a progressive that holds on to orthodox views? I, to me, they seem like they'd be at odds, but I don't, I don't know what your take well, on it is. I think that's a very good and fair question. I think that that's completely fair to ask that. So here's how I would answer. I am sure that in progressive churches, there are some people in the pews that love Jesus, that, that have put their trust in him and may not fully understand the deeper underpinnings of what they're being taught in their churches, for sure. But what, who I'm interacting with are the progressive thought leaders. These are the people who are writing the books. They've, uh, they're the ones promoting the podcast. They're writing the blog posts. They're the ones who have gathered the movement into a community. So they are the ones with whom I'm interacting with their ideas. And so I would say, no, there is, there is no way 
to be a progressive in the sense of what they're teaching and be orthodox. It's one or the other. But that's not to say that somebody, you know, there couldn't be somebody in the pews who's a little confused about things. Um, but, uh, you know, all the progressive leaders, and, and, I, and I only call someone a progressive leader if they affirm certain things, like if they're, they're going to affirm same-sex marriage, they are going to have a particular view of the Bible, they are denying the atonement, um, and they, you know, the, the view of the gospel is not the real gospel. And yeah. so those are the people I would say, yeah, that's the progressive leaders. Those are the ones leading the movement. They're the ones, you know, speaking at the Evolving Faith Conference. They're the ones that are, um, you know, they're all going on each other's podcasts. It's not difficult to see that they're all in unity together, even though they might have a few different beliefs about a few things. The core things, at least that I've discovered over the last several years of reading their books, they're very, very united on. Do you think that there are some denominations, this is another question from a viewer, do you think there are some denominations that are more apt to fall for progressive Christianity? Like aside from, he says, aside from like the more liberal main, main, uh, mainline, mainline denominations, are there, like, yeah. is it a, like, oh, I belong to this denomination. So, eh, you know, it was a slippery slope anyway. I think that. I mean, this is my opinion. I'm not saying that this is data driven or anything like that, but from my observation, it seems like the the sort of non denominational mega church is very vulnerable because a lot uh, as you know as churches get bigger and their message gets broader, uh, there can be a lot of people in the pews who are reading Jen Hatmaker books, but there's not really going to be a lot of people challenging them because because the church is so broad and smaller groups might even, in fact, here's a perfect example. I know someone who went to a small group. There's a very, very large mega church right here in Tennessee that doctrinally is sound. It's uh, their belief statement is sound. I would say the highest level of pastors are all sound in their theology, but on the lower levels, because the church is so big, uh, I, I don't know what kind of vetting process they go through, but there was a leader of a small group that was telling everybody in the small group that, you know, hey, it's really likely Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. And, you know, the Bible isn't the only ancient book that talks about Jesus. And so this person who went to the group was like, called me like, how do I answer that? But I think we see that on the grassroots level and that also knowing that, I mean, I was looking at a Twitter thread today from progressives who were all saying, I'm staying in my evangelical church because I want to change things at the small group level. I am going to stay. I'm not going to leave. I'm going to try to change the minds of all the people in my small group and start there. So whereas evangelicals are sort of top down in that the pastors are probably fine, the belief statement's fine, but as you trickle down, you have progressives infiltrating on the bottom levels. And the bigger a church is, the wider it is belief-wise as far as being non-denominational, not really constrained by the particular belief statements of a particular denomination, um, I think that there's a lot of vulnerability there. That's not to say that the denominations aren't vulnerable as well. We're seeing, of course, a huge battle go on in the United Methodist denomination that we've also seen happen in the Presbyterian denomination in Anglican, where they'll, you know, they've ended up having to split off. Right. And and so nobody's, you know, free from from the influence. But um, but I I do think there's a vulnerability in that sort of large non-denominational megachurch. Um, that just doesn't have a lot of um, troops on the ground, I guess I could, you might say. I know we're way over time, Elisa. You're being so generous. Do you have time for one more question? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, we've gotten a few variations of this question in the, in the chat, and I, I want to um, bring this up. Let's say I find myself having coffee with my friend, and all of a sudden I realize... My friend is drifting into progressive theology. Mm -hmm. She's reading Jen Hatmaker books or she's listening to Peter Enz's podcast or something, or she's really getting into Richard Rohr. Um, what do I do? Like, yeah. uh, do you, have you found any strategies for critical questions to ask that person or, you know, how to help give that person another way of deconstructing their faith because maybe you know sometimes deconstructing our faith from evangelical american evangelicalism is not a bad project but yeah. we want to reconstruct it into historic christianity 
But do you have any thoughts about if I find myself across from coffee with somebody, like how to help them connect those dots a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you, you, you brought in your question, you said, what questions should I ask? And I think that's key because what we have to understand is that there's a whole lot of philosophical underpinnings to the impetus that's going to drive somebody into this movement. There's almost, almost always, it's a reaction to whatever type of evangelicalism they've, they've been exposed to. And so I think that asking questions is the best way to go because if we start making dogmatic statements that's probably what they're what they're wanting to get a break from is just being told you can't ask questions you can't do this you must do this you must believe this and so they're sort of like you know if they're if they're getting into someone like Richard Rohr chances are there there are some wounds there because he's very congenial he's very grandfatherly people feel very safe with him i've i've had several people email me um really upset that I criticized him because they came out of a background of abuse and he was, you know, his writings and everything, um, has, has brought them some comfort. And so, so there's, there's an element of just being aware that there's something they're walking away from. There's something about the gospel that's not beautiful to them. There's something about the church, about Christianity, about God, about the Bible that has ceased to be beautiful to them, which is why they would even consider these other ideas in the first place. So asking questions is a really good starting place, like maybe try to get to the bottom of what they're walking away from. It, you know, if, if somebody were to tell me, I mean, I guess just the way I would do it is if they say, hey, I've read this Richard Rohr book and it's just blowing my mind, I might just say, well, what do you, what do you love about it? What's, what's the idea that's really got you hooked in and, and just, you know, kind of feel it out from there. And maybe if they're willing to have a discussion based on the scripture, but see, that's the thing is in progressive paradigm, often the, the conversation isn't in the realm of what does the Bible say about this anymore? It's, you know, what does my personal conscience lead me to believe even about the Bible. And so it, it can be sort of a, a difficult conversation to maneuver, but I think just asking a lot of questions, getting Greg Kokel's book Tactics is a great resource. I, I think that that book is more written on just how to have conversations with anyone who's kind of skeptical about Christian beliefs. But I mean, you could slap the title Tactics for Progressive Christians right on the top of his book because all of those tactics are going to help you have a more fruitful conversation with your friends when they're kind of being tempted by these ideas. And um, as, as Greg Kogel says in the book, you know, you just want to put a little pebble in their shoe. You, you don't have to convert them all the way back over to your side in 30 minutes. But if you can just ask a few questions that irritate a little bit, I mean, I, I've had that happen to me where somebody would ask a question, it bugs me for like a week. And then I end up really investigating something that maybe I was wrong about. And so, um, and so I think that that's a really, you know, it's a great practical resource to get that book tactics by Greg Kokel to help with really with any conversation, but especially effective with people who have more of a postmodern relativistic mindset that that book is really helpful. That's really good advice. Uh, our friend Susanna is asking the question, question said questions aren't always allowed to be asked in certain evangelical circles. And I would say, Suzanne, I think that's changing. I know that you left an evangelical church, you know, a long time ago, but that's changing. And I think that, you know, questions are much more open and accepted and allowed now. And apologetics has really grown in the last 20 years. So I'm going to push back a little bit on that with you. But um, uh, to disagree with one another over non-essentials, I, I don't know what you think about this, Elisa, but one of the things that I've really run into is I think that people um, often take it for granted what that they know the difference between essentials and non-essentials of the faith. Yeah. And, you know, that you'll hear this saying of like, well, it's not a salvation issue, so it's OK. We can just agree to disagree. That's not enough of a criteria to determine what is essential and what's not essential. You know, like the issue of gay marriage, I would say, is an issue. Uh, defining marriage is an is part of the Christian worldview. Christian, the Christian worldview is not just merely our salvation; it includes that, but it's not merely that. And I think that this question of how do we even identify the non-essentials is a big question when you're talking to a progressive, 
one of the big questions you have to chase after with them is by what standard? How do you know what, how are you defining what the essentials of the faith are? I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Well, I think that that's a fair observation she makes. I think that in, in, in my book, I even have a chapter on why people are leaving to go into progressive Christianity. And one of those things is that they weren't allowed to ask certain questions in whatever sort of paradigm they grew up in. Now, I am blessed that I grew up in an evangelical environment where I didn't feel like there was anything I couldn't ask. I, even my youth pastors, my parents, not that they always knew the answer, but I, I never felt like anyone was threatened by my questions or anything like that. But I do, I've met a lot of people who have grown up in, in an environment where they were told like, just have faith or just read the Bible or stop, stop doubting and just, you know, don't question things. And so I think that that's a very real, um, I think that's a reality for a lot of people. And I do think, Krista, I agree with you that it is changing. I think as, as more apologists kind of come out and say, come on guys, we've got to get better at engaging some of these, these questions. I think there's another element that has done a lot of harm. And that is sort of as, you know, the internet is a crazy place, everybody. It's a crazy place. <laughs> like we have reinvented the Tower of Babel, no doubt. And with that, there's a lot of great stuff. You can have access to amazing resources, but there's also this phenomenon of hypercritical, overly dogmatic, hyper legalistic, uh, like discernment type ministries where you oh, can yes. virtually put any preacher or writer, you could put their name into the search bar and there's going to be an article about why they're a heretic. They're and probably putting us on blast right now. You, are, you probably shouldn't be talking to me. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> are you a heretic too? I, I might be. Yeah. There's a okay. few things. Cause yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, yeah. So, so I think that there, there can be, um, that can do a lot of harm too. And so, but I think what we have to do is, is, each one of us are responsible to parse those things out and say, okay, what are the essentials? What, what, what is really like, there are issues theologically that are really important to me. And I have very strong opinions on, but I also, and I, I wouldn't say they're not important, but they're not core essentials of what define Christianity. They're issues that Christians disagree about. Now, I may not choose to go to a church that affirms such and such, whatever this view is, because I feel very strongly about it. But I have a few different things that I have in those categories where it's like, I don't like it. I would not choose to be a member of a church that believes this, but it's not a, it's not a, a core essential, like defining characteristic of Christianity. And so I think that everybody's responsible to sort of parse that out. And even though somebody may have grown up in, a, in an environment where they weren't allowed to ask questions, um, you know, maybe, maybe look around because there are a lot of people who are engaging those types of questions. Yeah. And, and so, uh, yeah. That's good. All right. Thank yeah. you, Elisa. This Thank has you been so much. So such a treat to be able to sit and talk with you a bit. Well, same here. I love you guys. This was fun. And yes. uh, yeah. I hope we'll we get, it. I hope we get to all do a conference together someday. We can talk about progressive Christianity and critical theory, critical race theory. And yeah. how they're all tied together. How they're all bit. tied together. That would be fun. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> so, all right. all right. Well, thank you. I want to encourage you. everyone go pre-order Elisa's book right now on Amazon. It's coming out. Some people were fall. mentioning that they already have it. That, oh, I mean, awesome. they already pre-ordered it. All right. So, so yes. go click. Go click on it. Go pre-order. It's going to be fantastic. And um, if people want to know more about progressive Christianity before your book comes out, is there another book maybe that you can can recommend to them? Yeah, there's not a ton out there. There is Michael Kruger wrote a little kind of booklet called The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. And he's interacting with more of the uh, the scholarship that goes back a little bit, but it's still very relevant. Uh, so that's a book they can get. There's a book by a uh, Biola professor, um, R. Scott Smith, called Authentically Emergent. Now, he goes really deep philosophically. I and love Dr. Smith. Monique calls yeah. him Uncle, he, Uncle Dr. He, Smith. He, Uncle Dr. Smith, yes. So he, <laughs> he actually not only analyzed the theology of the founders of the movement, like Brian McLaren, Tony Jones, and... Uh, 
uh, Doug Paget, but he also goes really deep philosophically on what's what's informing their theology. So it's a bit, it's a little dense. You know, you have to really like like that stuff. Um, but it's very good. And uh, and so then, if people yeah, want so, more of like the intellectual underpinnings, yeah. that would be yeah. a good one. That's a good one. It's yeah, it, it's really philosophical. Yeah, like, it's it's he really goes good. deep into the into the like if people really want like the intellectual. Foundation yeah, like their for view all this of the stuff. soul, what kind of a being we are. Yeah. All, like he goes deep into okay. that. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Elisa. We really appreciate your time and hanging out with us tonight. Thanks, you guys. All Thanks right. So take much. care. Bye. Bye bye. Wow. That was, that was fantastic. That was good. It's yes. not every day you get to talk to somebody who's one of your heroes. That's fantastic. Um, okay. So, one final thing is the tweet. The tweet of the week. Of the week. The tweet of the week. Well, it's very extra. So the tweet of the week is brought to you by the Center for Biblical Unity and the world famous tweeter, the real Monique D. Oh, <laughs> well, there's that. If you believe your accusations of racism should be believed simply because you're a minority, check your privilege. That is what I said. So tell us a little bit about what went into that tweet. Um, I just think that at times, and it was it was specifically surrounding the Ahmad situation, but that there can be um, like cries for racial justice which i think should always happen like if some if there's something that is unjust i think justice should should be played out but i also think that we can and when i say we i feel like blacks minorities whatever can say that well this is racist we can um ascribe a motive to someone's heart without knowing really what's fully happening and we ex we can expect to be believed and i think that's a privilege like we talk a lot about white privilege and so if we're talking about white privilege every um every group has some form of privilege it's not just white people who experience privilege as children of god we experience privilege so what is it within my own group that that can be exercised as a privilege. And I think at times when we just say, well, this is racist and don't question me because I know racism because we have a 150 years of a racist past, you know, you should believe me. I think that's a privilege that, that we hold and we don't always identify it as a privilege. Usually we are believed. And that doesn't mean that when people, when we are believed that it's not a racist act. I just think that we need to really investigate what, what privileges we do hold and not just put the, the idea of privilege onto white people and say, well, only whites have privilege. I think that there are privileges within every, every ethnic group. There it is, Monique challenging the system. Yes, I am <laughs> trying to every once in a while. Well, it's been a good show. I'm excited that Elisa came on. I want to encourage everyone to go uh, subscribe to the show notes for the show where we will put links and extra resources in, in there for everyone. And be sure to follow us on social media, follow our um, YouTube channel, all the things show. Uh, we're across all of the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, be sure to hit the notifications bell so you'll get alerts, like, follow, share. That is the biggest thing we really need from you guys. If you love the show, support the show with shares. I want to say a shout out. Thank you, Keisha, for sharing the show. I think Christina Miller shared the show tonight. Yeah, we have a ton of shares tonight, thank especially you. on Facebook. It's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing the show. Carmen just asked me, yeah. um, do you know the Addisons from airing the Addisons? They discussed this in depth. I am not familiar, but I'll check it out. I don't know that. Jeremy says, I'll stand in show tonight. Thanks, oh, Jeremy. Good. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for tuning in. I know that uh, Davis has said they ordered Elisa's book. Mm -hmm. So that's a great thing. Um, be sure to check out more about Elisa Childers in the American Gospel Christ Crucified. Yeah. It is available. I think it's like a $4 rent or something. Yeah. Uh, it's really but well, we're the go watch it together as a family. Even if you got to spread it out over a couple nights. What's interesting about the documentary is they juxtapose Elisa's story with Bart Campolo. If you've ever heard of Tony Campolo, Bart Campolo 
Campolo is his son. And you he see side by side, both of them going through their deconstructing process. Elisa eventually reconstructs her faith into historic Christianity. Bart Campolo deconstructs his faith to the place where he's an agnostic now. And so it's really their journeys are sort of put in parallel as the documentary unfolds. So, yeah, definitely go check out American Gospel, Christ Crucified. It's a great follow-up to this episode. At least I'm just going to say she's in the chat box. Hey, now. <laughs> yes. Oh, American Gospel is on Netflix now. Oh, very cool. And, Carmen, I don't know what AFR is. American Family Radio. It's right oh. underneath there. Where? Under your text that says, what is it? Oh, America. There, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. They are on Facebook. Awesome. I'll check them out. Yes. Um, very good. I High five. Yes. <laughs> Girl. Hashtag fan. Yes. <laughs> we need that fan. We need that. We've decided we're going to have a prop. It's going to be the all the things fan. So we could just fan the, the guests when they just make points that we love. Sometimes you got a fan. A little yes. black church. We also need to have sound effect. I keep meaning me to mention, Bob, we need a sound effect of a Hammond organ so we can have a little. No, not just the organ. We really need the drums so and that the when organ. they get the shouting music, like, hey, don't, double pop it. Don't, don't. Yeah. yeah. See, now if you know, you know. But if you don't know, you might not know. <laughs> Keisha knows. But yes. <laughs> Everybody, you know, some people might know. She might not know, you know. No, she said hashtag fan. She, I, yes. think, I think she might know. She might know. All right, it's time for us to go. I need some shrimp tacos in my life. All right, people. Bye, you guys. We'll see you next week. Be sure to tune in to my live stream on Tuesday night. We're talking about how to answer God's call to justice. And it's going to be part one of a conversation about justice. So Yes. We are leaving now. Ah. Bye. <laughs> shrimp tacos, people. Priorities. <laughs>